Welcome. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit tonight about the concert and the topic, the theme of our concert. Um, I always do thematic concerts of some kind. And um, I wanted to, I mean, I always try to pick music that's meaningful, but uh, I, one of our um, sociology professors came to me over the summer and uh, the theater professor had programmed um, the diary of Anne Frank, which was produced this last weekend. How many of you went to see Anne Frank? Did you catch that? It's fantastic. Um, but uh, she, the sociology professor said, hey, why don't we use this opportunity to really talk about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism and Jewish persecution and kind of the whole history of, of what led into the Holocaust. So I said, yeah, that's great. And there's a conference called the Bell for Conference. It's hosted by the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And they hosted it virtually this year. So I was able to attend some of that and uh, attend some of the lectures. And it's just, you think you know, you know, something, and then you realize you know hardly anything. So it was a great education for me. And um, I'm really looking forward to this opportunity tonight to speak with you all about this. And we have multiple guests tonight to help me with this, so I'm very excited about that. But one of the things, uh, when I was first thinking about this concert and what I wanted to call it, uh, I thought about the word humanity and what that means. And I kind of used that term before, you know, for other concerts, but the definition of humanity, the qualities that make us human, which differentiates us from inanimate objects without emotion. Things like love and compassion and kindness and empathy. And the word humane means to show kindness and compassion to others. And I think it's really important for all of us to remember that that is literally the essence of our existence. It's so essential for our lives, and we, we are empowered to make choices about how we treat one another, and um, to make an effort to be positive and fruitful in our interactions with one another, and to not just do that on occasion, you know, to not just, I'm gonna go donate my time here, I'm gonna be nice today, but just to try to work that into our lives, to be generous and to be kind and to help others even when we don't have time. And I think that's often a challenge for us, but it's, sometimes it's a much bigger picture of supporting those who need support emotionally, logistically, many different ways. So um, I just wanted to kind of talk about that because I think that's the main theme of what um, we're doing tonight. So uh, this, you can go to the next slide, thanks. Um, so we, I want to talk, start off by talking about immigration, immigration, and rejection of the Jewish people. And I, I, I will try not to talk too much tonight because there's way too much information to share. So I tried to sort of uh, narrow this down. So I have a map, actually Chris, by the way, everyone welcome Chris Otto. This is Chris Otto, our English professor. Um, Chris found this map, and this is going way back to the 15th, 17th centuries, but it shows kind of, you see the arrows and kind of the directions of how the Jewish people as a unit, as a group, had to move around. And it was often because of persecution, for those 200 years of, of being um, persecuted and then kind of forced out of their home and then forced to move to a new place and then the same thing, and then forced to move to another new place. So this is a, a very, very long-standing history of anti-Semitism, and um, that's a big part of where we're heading with our story tonight. So, um, Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe, uh, this was basically 1820 to 18, or 1924, but the first part of that, 1820 to 1880, was mostly like the social, political upheaval in Eurasia, and um, it was like 1820 to 1880, Jews were fleeing from Central Europe, at that time, even many from Germany, this was long before World War II. Um, and at that time, the Jewish population of the United States, many of them were coming here, the Jewish population of the United States increased, in that 60 years, increased from 3,000 to 300,000. So that's a huge number of people looking for, free, fleeing from persecution. And then 1880 to 1924 was another time um, where the Jews were coming more from like Eastern Europe and Russia. And uh, at this point, the Jewish population increased to 2.5 million by 1924. 
in the United States. So another huge influx of people. Um, up until this time of 1924, this was a great option for Jews to come here and find freedom. And um, in 1924, then, there was um, a change of immigration laws. And um, we'll talk about that, too. But this, the important part of this is when all those Jews came here, they became an integral part of the United States. They joined the working class of the United States, had this huge, strong um, cultural and soci so, so, socially cohesive uh, communities, mostly settling in urban areas, um, and um, we know, right, we know on the Statue of Liberty that the, inscri uh, the inscription on the Statue of Liberty, this was actually from a sonnet written by Emma Lazarus in 1883, um, and she worked for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. So she's the one who wrote this, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And this was, of course, this was a vision for America to come and provide respite for those who were seeking freedom and opportunity. Um, there, I found a couple of cool musical examples. Um, this is actually a song that was written by Irving Berlin, a famous composer of a lot of popular music and Broadway songs. Um, he was a Jewish immigrant as well from Russia, and he wrote this song in 1885 um, using the words of Emma Lazarus from the um, Statue of Liberty. So this was written, this song was written for his Broadway musical that was entitled Miss Liberty. And it was, the musical itself was actually portraying the dedication of the actual Statue of Liberty. So, um, that's, the first song we're gonna play is talking about um, the, the Jewish culture of the 1880s. I don't know how many of you know the story of Fiddler on the Roof. Have you, how many have you seen this? Broadway production, movie version. It's fantastic. If you have never seen it, go rent it somewhere online where you can get a hold of it. You have it on Hoodoo, wherever it works. But it's, it's great. It's an amazing story with some of the greatest songs and meaning to the music. And I should have just printed all the lyrics for you because it, each one of these songs is so meaningful. But it's about an older couple living in a Jewish, Russian, Russian Jewish village. Their daughters are coming of age and they're trying to find matches for them. So at the time they used a matchmaker, so you didn't get to choose who you were going to marry. So they used the town matchmaker to put together this boy and this girl, and sometimes it was this girl and this old man. So you didn't really get that choice. And so that's a lot of the story. Um, so there's a song about matchmakers, there's a song about sunrise, sunset, of the couple getting older and thinking about their marriage and how they didn't get to choose one another. And here they are together, you know, 50 years, 40 years later. So it's, it's just a really touching story. So if you know the music, great. If you don't, I hope you enjoy it and um, check it out, check the video out.
image. Yeah. So we have, I found a couple of images to talk about um, kind of when um, all these immigrants, Jewish immigrants, came to America, right? And, and there, uh, the Americans at the time were extremely supportive and would often protest the kind of persecution that the Jewish people were experiencing el elsewhere. So I found a few examples of art because we often, artists, musicians, we use art and we use music to make social statements all the time. And so these were examples, um, the first one here, this was a, an artwork talking about stopping um, the Russian oppression of the Jews. And uh, this particular one uh, was from 1905, and uh, it was uh, following a pogrom, which is a mass killing that happened of the Jews in um, Kishinev, um, Russia. And in this picture, you can see um, the Jews are carrying the oppression on their shoulders and hanging from those little bundles you can really see. It says, uh, autocracy, robbery, cruelty, assassination, deception, murder. And in the very background, um, you can see a Jewish community burning. And in the upper left-hand corner is where you see actually Theodore Roosevelt. And he's speaking to the Emperor of Russia, uh, Nicholas II. And he's saying, now that you have peace without, why not remove this burden and have peace within your borders? Um, and then there was another artwork that I found um, that was just demonstrating uh, Jews you know, think of that as the Atlantic Ocean, right? And the Jews standing on the on the coast and the symbol of Russia above them and the Americans on the other side with their American symbol um, welcoming them. And then there were a couple of examples of music, um, music in protest. So this first one is actually an elegy, so an elegy is a piece written for the dead. And this was composed in April of 1903 after the Kishinev massacre. Um, 49 Jews were murdered and hundreds were wounded. and. Uh, the elegy is written in seven different parts. It's called The First Signs of Storm, The Luckless in Despair, The Bugle Call of the Rioters to One Another, The Victims in Their Agony, The Wailings of Women and Children, and The Devilish Work in Force, and The Survivors Beg for Bread. So there's seven different parts to this piece. So I thought that was interesting. There's kind of an image of the massacre in the middle there. Uh, this is another song. This was actually a Yiddish-American popular song. Uh, that was rooted from um, back in the Jewish minst minst minstrelsy, um, and it had like minst was was addressing basically current social, economic, political themes. It's called the Fire Victims, and it was an elegy to um, a, a, a huge fire that happened and killed 146 people. Most of them were Jewish and Italian immigrant women. So the fire happened at a, a factory. It was called the Triangle Shirt Waste Company and um, all these people perished in the fire. And it basically, it's about the horrendous working conditions that they have. These are really unsafe working conditions and then all these people died, and so this was written in protest of that. Um, and then, what things kind of started to turn. So Americans supported the Jews and welcomed them, and then we started seeing some anti-Semitism in the United States, and uh, Americans began persecuting the Jews. And we saw this with several of our leaders, um, and, and economic leaders and people in industry, and Henry Ford happened to be one of them. Um, he actually launched a whole series of attacks on the Jews based on this uh, writing called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And it was actually an anti-Semitic work that was actually concocted by the Russian secret police. And um, the whole thing is describing the Jews as secretly plotting world revolution and controlling the world's financial market markets. And, and Ford was giving these out. His, he was, you know, found an audience that was interested in knowing this, even though it was all fake. It wasn't real. And so um, he, but he put, he, he printed these, and he had seventy thousand of these sent out, um, up to seven hundred thousand eventually by 1924. And these were circulated uh, in print. So. Um, Eventually, they took Ford to court, actually, and he ended up apologizing uh, to the Jewish people and promised to cease his attacks on the Jewish people. So, but then in 1924 was when things really changed in the U.S. And so, they have the Immigration Act of 1924, and this is when the U.S. decided to, they wanted to start limiting, in limiting the number of immigrants into the United States and setting quotas. And basically, it was all set on, you can only have a certain number of people depending from each country, depending upon how many have already come over here, depending upon the percentage of the population of those people already here in this country. And because there had been such a huge influx of Eastern Europeans and Jews 
um, from the Eastern European country, they're really limited now their opportunity to come in. Very few people were able to come in after 1924, which had an effect later on as well in World War II. So um, there are many famous Jews uh, and their descendants, and three I've listed here, Albert Einstein, we all know, and the other two, Leonard Bernstein and George Gershwin, were both composers, and we're going to play two pieces by them. So there's a picture of Albert Einstein here. Um, and this was one of those things where, you know, when Albert Einstein was amazing, and he was Jewish, but of course, we want him here. We, he became a United States citizen in 1936, and, and we welcomed him because he was brilliant, right? And this is kind of this selective process of who we want here and who we don't. Um, but the two composers that we're going to be talking about, uh, George Gershwin and Leonard Bernstein, the next two pieces, um, were also of Jewish descent. So both of them had parents that immigrated in the, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, Jewish immigrants from Russia. And so they're the two sons of Jewish immigrants from Russia. So we're going to play uh, Slava, it's a fun, fast piece by Leonard Bernstein. And then we're going to play uh, Porgy and Bess, which is one of George Gershwin's most famous operas, actually. It was an opera written for an all-black cast. It was the first one ever written for that. So it's a great story, it's great music, so I hope you enjoy it.
are. Um, our clarinet soloist got caught trying to cross the bridge from Illinois on Tuesday. Apparently, it was completely closed off. So uh, he just arrived. I think Mark's going to go check on him. Um, but I can talk a little bit about um, culture. So this next piece we're going to do actually is um, a, a perfect example of the types of Jewish culture that were then brought over to the United States. Um, this type of music is called klezmer. And um, it was uh, it, it, it's a song, sometimes there's words, it's sung in the Yiddish language. But the original term klezmer was actually used to describe a bum who plays vulgar music. But it's based in the Ashkenazi Judaism, um, but very, very heavily influenced by the Roma peoples of Eastern Europe, um, but mixed with other European styles from Russia and Poland and Romania and Germany. Um, it really flourished in uh, Eastern Europe, and then um, an American klezmer eventually adopted styles of jazz, and it's a little bit different than the European type of klezmer. So um, they really thrived anyway through the mass immigration of the very early 20th century. By 1942, there were over, over 700 recordings that had been made of klezmer music. And in the 1970s and 1980s, okay, okay. the 1970s and 1980s, there was actually like a revival of klezmer music in the US. Um, and that, that kind of American klezmer actually spread back over to Europe and to Israel. So by 1990, there were over 50 klezmer bands in the United States. And really, klezmer is kind of one of those first types of fusion music of all these different cultures uh, fusing together. So, I would like to introduce go back there, a very good friend of mine. Uh, this is Jeffrey Collins. Actually, I want to tell you a little bit about Jeff before we that way. <laughs> Jeffrey's information in the program, so I just want to tell you a little bit about it. He is, first of all, we're good friends. We've known each other for way too long. And um, 24 years, maybe something like that. Um, uh, Jeff is, uh, I'll just read the book. Degrees in clarinet and saxophone, Jeff Collins enjoys exciting career as a freelance musician. He's played in the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, he's played in the Kansas City Orchestra, the Illinois, Syracuse, among others. He's an amazing saxophonist, actually, so a lot of this orchestral work was actually done on the saxophone. He's toured with the Jimmy Dorsey Band, he's played with Ray Charles, Aretha Franklin, Art Garfunkel, and his favorite was Bernadette Peters. Yeah! <laughs> As a clarinetist, Jeffrey plays in the St. Louis-based klezmer band called Klezuntypes, a band that's been around for a while. I got to play with them also on saxophone for a while. Um, and it's, it's fun, y'all. I'll kind of explain this music in a minute. He's won numerous competitions, the Artist Pre uh, Presentation Society Coleman Chamber Music Competition, in his free time, he enjoys working on old cars and old houses. That is very cool. Um, so, I, just briefly, klezmer music is, um, it's like juice party music. It's fun music. And it's used in a lot of the, the, the bat mitzvahs, the bar mitzvahs, the sim katoras, all these different celebrations. And I like to, I don't know if anybody else calls it that, but I like to call it Jewish polka. I'm German, so I grew up dancing polkas with my family. But it's like Jewish polka. and. Um, I used to go to the Simpatora Festival, uh, actually played with the Klezmer Band, a Simpatora thing, in, um, uh, up in the city. And they, I don't know if you know what the Torah looks like. So the Torah is actually still on a scroll. It's the first five books of the Old Testament. But it's written out on a scroll. They you know, go through their church year reading the verses of the, of the Torah. And then when they get to the end of the scroll, they have a big celebration. They unroll the entire scroll. They have to have a building long enough to do this. So they design a building. They put one on this end and one on this end, and then they, they re-roll it back to the beginning, and then they restart their church year, basically. So in the meantime, they put it on their shoulder, the Torah, they roll it up, they put it on their shoulder, they all dance around the room, they parade around the room, there's kids, there's flags. It's super fun. It's just great music. So I hope you really enjoy this piece, uh, Klezmer Fantasy.
to reintroduce Chris Otto, our uh, English professor. He's going to be presenting um, more information for you about uh, Jewish anti-Semitism and general history of it a little bit, but also just leading into the Holocaust. Thank you. I don't know if this microphone is on, but it sounds like it is, so that's good. Um, so in between 1939 and 1945, six million Jews were killed um, across Europe. And um, this, is, this is a function of um, a, a hate-filled ideology. And if you were to go to Britain or France or Germany in the 1930s, and if you were to try to decide which of those three countries would be most likely to end up with the Holocaust, you might be surprised to know that Germany would probably not be your first guess. And that is because the Jewish community was so well integrated into Germany. Um, there's no way in this short time period that I can really do very much justice to how we get from this ancient anti-Judaism to the Holocaust. Um, but what I want to do is I want to talk about three uh, pillars um, deicide, which is the killing of uh, Christ, ritual slaughter, and then this uh, kind of global conspiracy. And I want to build that link up to the uh, Nuremberg race laws and um, try to provide a little bit of context to uh, help, help people kind of understand a little bit about where um, some of this uh, information came from. So um, Jesus was Jewish. And I know that uh, when I learned about that, I was kind of surprised by that. That didn't seem to make sense to me. Uh, the Last Supper was probably the Passover. And Jesus was crucified by Romans under the rule of uh, Pontius Pilate. When the Romans destroyed the Jewish temple in Israel, or in, the, in uh, Jerusalem, that sort of began this uh, scattering process. But Christians, early Christians, condemn the Jews for slaying the Christian Messiah. There are even a couple of passages in, in the New Testament from 1 Thessalonians, the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus, and then from Matthew 27, members of the Jewish community tell Pilate, his blood be on us and our children. And of course, the early Christian church viewed this as anti-Judaism. They, they were upset with, with the uh, fact that they weren't um, converting and becoming um, uh, uh, Christians. Um, because, Jewish, because Jews could not own land, they couldn't really be farmers, and because they were uh, hated by Christians, it was difficult for them to get jobs in certain guilds. This left money laundering, not money laundering, money lending, as one of the few occupations that they were really able to um, uh, encounter. And this leads to a whole body of, of um, anti-Semitic beliefs that Jews are greedy and uh, tight with money. Um, this blood libel becomes a really important, uh, one of these three pillars that leads to major anti-Semitism. And in 1475, a young boy named Simon disappeared in the city of Trent in Italy around the time of Easter. His father alleged that he'd been kidnapped and murdered by the local Jewish uh, community in order to take his blood and use it to make matzah for uh, Passover. So this blood libel was you know, kind of invented by this English, uh, by this monk, Sir Thomas of uh, Monmouth, and goes a long way to kind of depict Jews as kind of demonic, uh, bestial, and um, I think it's interesting about the uh, blood. There's a lot about the blood libel that reminds me of current QAnon, which is saying that there's this cabal of people who take children and use their blood. I don't, even, I don't know if that's intentional or not. Um, Luther had hoped to convert Jews, and when they refused to convert, part of the reason why Jews kept getting kicked out of where they lived is because they refused to um, bend on their ideology. They refused to worship new gods. They were very faithful. So when they didn't, Luther was upset. He called for the burning of synagogues, the burning of their homes. He wrote this book on the Jews and their lies in which he claimed that Jews were subhuman. They did not have souls. 
and that they were akin to animals. In the 1900s, and um, Elka mentioned this earlier with the Protocols of Zion, there was um, a renewed interest in this idea of anti-Semitic conspiracies. Here are some conspiracies from history. In the 1340s, they were blamed for bubonic plague. They were, it was said that they poisoned wells. Um, part of the reason why this, uh, the historical reason for this is because Jews weren't allowed to live in the village proper. They lived outside, so they weren't amongst the people who were passing the germs around. They also kept kosher and they washed their hands. So while the whole of Europe, probably one out of every three people died from Black Death, bubonic plague, only about one in 10 Jews actually died. So that looked to the people who were dying like they had something to do with it. Um, they're also been accused of desiccating or desecrating the host of the communion wafers. There's uh, the, the uh, murder of Christ is also part of world domination. And, and through the control of the banks and the media and um, uh, government institutions, there's a fear that they will be uh, controlling uh, the world. So anti-Judaism is what precedes anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism is a secular, political, cultural bias because um, it's based on race. And the idea is, is that Jews are not only a different religion, they're a different race. They're Semites. They're different. They're not uh, non-Aryans. And of course, Hitler and his uh, group were very good at building upon these latent fears. They were very good at exploiting this, um, this stuff that was out in the atmosphere. But Hitler's twist to all of this, and it's a major point that I want to make, um, and that is that misinformation or bad science is not benign. And so Hitler's idea of that history was the, the history of race um, struggle. He puts this into motion. And, and when I talk about, which I'm going to right now, the uh, Nuremberg Laws, Essentially, he is using this bad science, and you can see this, these images here of the different skulls. There was an attempt to scientifically prove that Northern Europeans were physically, morally, um, ethically, intellectually superior than other races. And what I think is interesting about that middle um, image is that, as you can see, that's the ideal uh, head there. That's the ideal skull. Notice that it's been rotated forward. The idea is, is that the, the more vertical that your skull is, that's the more highly evolved that you are. But if you look at the middle one, that one's clearly been rocked backwards to accentuate the idea of this sloping uh, forehead. So um, not, this is not, Hitler didn't make this up. He was reading books by philosophers and other historians who were making these claims. They were kind of building on Charles Darwin and the idea that, you know, the descent of man and that some are better than others. And this image right here on the far right, that was actually in a textbook that was taught in Germany in the 1930s. And the idea is to try to prove that the Aryan race is superior. And so Hitler had his um, scientists constantly trying to find definitive empirical evidence that would prove this but they never could, right? Because race is, 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 a, is a construct, and um, it's, it's not particularly, it's just not real. So the Nuremberg race laws, which were passed in 1935, so at this point, um, Hitler is the chancellor. He's kind of you know, destroyed the Reichstag, so he's got full control. And the first thing that he, one of the big pieces of legislation that he passes are these race laws. And in these Nuremberg race laws, they contain the Reich citizenship law, which is depicted on the right, and then the law for the protection of German blood and German honor. And these two laws essentially make it illegal for Jews and Germans to marry. It also defines who can and who cannot be a citizen in the uh, Reich. It legally codifies one group of people being citizen and the other group of people being a second-class citizen. 
This is, these laws are the culmination of centuries of anti-Semitism, and they are the first step towards what will become the Holocaust. Because once you have this in place, now anything that you do to this unprotected minority group is a fair game. And uh, Hitler read widely, he believed there were two races, the master race and then all others, who he referred to as the mud race. And I wanted to share just a short passage here. I know you want to hear the music. I, I wanted to share a short passage from Viktor Frankl's book. He was, a, um, he was in a Nazi um, concentration camp. And he, I think this passage is interesting about the two uh, races. So he writes about his experience being in a concentration camp. If you've never read this book, <clears throat> I, would ref I would highly recommend it. I'm going to refer back to Franco <clears throat> a little bit later. So here he's recounting a moment in, in, during his time in the concentration camp. And he writes, I remember how one day a foreman secretly gave me a piece of bread which I knew he must have saved from his breakfast ration. It was far more than the small piece of bread which moved me to tears at the time. It was the human something which this man also gave to me, the word and look which accompanied this gift. From all this, we may learn that there are two races of men in the world, but only these two, the race of the decent man and the race of the indecent man. Both are found everywhere. They penetrate into all groups of society. No group consists entirely of decent or indecent people. In this sense, no group is a pure race, and therefore one occasionally found a decent fellow among the camp guards. So there he's talking about uh, one of the guards gave him a piece of bread, and then instead of having the master race and the mud races, there's two races, and they're decent and indecent people. Um, so the um, one other little tidbit that I wanted to uh, pass on to you, and that is that um, Hitler discovered Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, and he described going to battle against the Germanic barbarians. And he was writing back to try to explain why the Romans could not defeat these Germanic barbarians. And what he says is that they're eight feet tall. Right? He's inventing this. And when we shoot them with our arrows, these Germanic barbarians are so strong that the arrows just bounce off of them. And when we try to stab them, our steel breaks. Well, Hitler got that. And he got in his kind of twisted idea that if we could purify the German race, in other words, remove all of the mud races, we could return Germany to this time when they were undefeatable. They were eight feet tall, and they, they would be, you know, bullets would bounce off of them. So, again, bad science is not benign. Hatred and the ideology of hate does not resolve itself without intervention. And the third point that I would make about this is that, um, is that the, um, there's, there's, there's no way around, um, every time that there's an authoritarian regime, it always creates an us versus them dynamic. It's always premised upon an attack on the truth, attack on, the, attack on uh, humanity, an attack on reason. People are trying to tell you that what you see and what you hear isn't true and that there's this conspiracy to explain it. And um, it did take some time, but in 1998, Pope John Paul officially recognized the role that Catholics and, and sort of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, it also sort of apologized for its lack of um, attention, its lack of resistance to the Holocaust. Um, and so he writes that we cannot know how many Christians in countries occupied or ruled by the Nazi powers or their allies were horrified at the disappearance of their Jewish neighbors, and yet were not strong enough to raise their voices in protest. For Christians, this heavy burden of conscience of their brothers and sisters during the Second World War must be called to a penance. Um, 
And I'm going to pause right now. I don't know where, um, if, if there's going to be, because I, I was going to talk about this afterwards, but I guess I'll talk about it now. So the, um, the survival, there were people who obviously survived the, um, and instead of trying to explain that in my terms, I thought I would share some, a short passage. This is from a book called Born Survivors. And I got this at the Belfort Conference. This is about two women who went to, um, one went to Auschwitz, and the other one went to, I'm not exact, I can't remember, but another concentration camp. They were both pregnant. They concealed their pregnancies while in the um, concentration camp and both gave birth to uh, children. And um, this, yeah, it's called, it's called Born Survivors, and it's by Wendy Holleran. This is how she describes um, the liberation. She writes, while many of the prisoners were ecstatic at the Americans' arrival, crying, peace, welcome, or we are free, in a battle of languages, others just slumped where they lay, apathetic and indifferent. Others sat, overcome, tears streaming down their faces, praying that smiling men in uniforms weren't a cruel hallucination. Some of the younger women who dreamed of meeting GIs all their lives suddenly became self-conscious. Repelled by their own smell, they pinched their cheeks, tried in vain to smooth their hair, crawling with creatures and stuffed with dirt. And then she goes on to describe one medic who was from Aurora, Illinois. His name was Leroy Peterson. And he said when he got to the camp, I'd seen a lot before I got to the camp, right? But I was more affected by seeing the people that were starved and were just skin and bone. When he reached a hut where men slept five to a bunk, he found a skeleton with a weak pulse who died before his eyes. It was just a horrible mess, very strength consuming. The unarmed young medic had been warned not to get close to the prisoners or to let them embrace him because of all the vermin and infectious disease, but said they had just swarmed around him as he continued to work his way through the huts and examining the sick and dying. He was helpless to intervene when SS guards, trying to pass themselves off as prisoners, were discovered and beaten to death by those taking their revenge. And, the, and one other uh, passage here. This is from Ellie Weissel, uh, who won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. He was also a survivor of a, a concentration camp. His description of the, and it's, it's a nice corollary because these people decided that the guards, the ones that dressed up like prisoners to try to pass themselves off as Jews, they killed them. Here is what um, Weissel says about being liberated. Our first act as free men was to throw ourselves onto the provisions, the food that they brought home. That is all we thought about. No one thought of revenge or of parents, only of bread. And even when we were no longer hungry, not one of us thought of revenge. The next day, a few of the young men ran into Weimar to bring back some potatoes and clothes and to sleep with girls. But still, no trace of revenge. Three days after the liberation of Buchenwald, I became very ill, some form of poisoning. I was transferred to a hospital and spent two weeks before or between life and death. One day, when I was able to get up, I decided to look at myself in the mirror on the opposite wall. I had not seen myself since the ghetto. From the depths of the mirror, a corpse was contemplating me. The look in his eyes as he gazed at me has never left me. And so, in terms of survival and resilience, I think these two quotes are particularly apropos. Ellie Weissel says that you must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. And when I said that hate does not resolve itself, the reason is because the ideology of hate is fueled by people who want to take it farther and show their loyalty and devotion to that hatred ideology. And when Viktor Frankl says, those who have a why to live can bear almost any how, this is the philosophy that allowed them to survive in the death camp. And I ask my students that same question, what is your why and how could you survive any uh, kind of situation?
Um, even though hopefully nothing will ever be like what he had to go through. Ever again? I don't know. I still see signs. I see uh, this is from Charlottesville in the upper left hand corner. That's a Nazi salute. I see a swastika uh, banner and I see another swastika. I see this um, group of people with these tiki torches is very reminiscent of the um, mass rallies at Nuremberg in Bavaria, the southern part of Germany, which is reminiscent of um, these rallies. And then the bottom right hand corner is another Nazi symbol in front of the US Capitol on January 6th. So I would just end by saying misinformation or pseudoscience, however you want to call it, is not benign. The second one is that their um, hate does not resolve itself without inter intervention. And um, what's the third one? I can't remember. The third one is the uh, there's there's uh, hate hate is never resolves itself, and you can't misinformation is bad. <laughs> I have all these notes. I didn't write the three most important. Things. This is the lesson for you. Always write down your three main points on your cards. I got those So um, yeah, hate does not resolve itself. Misinformation is bad, and that authoritarian uh, regimes always begin with an attack on the truth. And so that's um, that's my point. That's my part. <laughs>
is uh, Aaron Copeland, American composer, uh, very famous icon. He, he's, he's an American icon, and people describe his music as you know, having this American sound or having this kind of big, broad, wide open sound to the way he scores things. And um, this piece that we're going to do is called Fanfare for the Common Man. And I wanted to end with this because I think this is such a great Copeland himself and this piece in particular. You've probably heard it, you know, Fourth of July, fireworks, etc. But it's it's a real symbol for American freedom um, in, in the world of musical pieces. So. And I wanted to play it also because Aaron Copeland is also uh, the son of um, Jewish immigrants from Lithuania. So another one of our great composers that we have here, had here in the US, um, who came from immigrants. So I hope you enjoyed the concert. And um, this is uh, always a treat for me. I, I love this group and they're super fun. And I get to make music with them every Monday night and it's awesome. So. Um, Thank you to all of them for this, and I uh, hope you enjoy the last one. Thank you. 